So far, we've been talking primarily about Spring Web MVC and how you communicate from client to server and so on using the mechanisms that are built into there to simplify your programming effort to deal with HTTP creation of GET requests and then the, the conversion of GET requests back into Java native types and so on. We're going to switch gears now and talk about the next interesting topic in the course, which is the new Java threading model that has just come out a couple months ago. So I'm really excited about this because this is part of what we'll be able to cover in this course that I've not been able to cover in any real depth in earlier courses. So we're going to talk about Java platform threads versus Java virtual thread. And we're going to talk about what the differences are between these two different types of threads. And you can find this discussion if you take a look at the Java 19 documentation for the thread class. Traditionally, a Java thread was an object that contained various methods and fields that constituted its state. There's a bunch of state that a thread has. A thread has state like a name, an identifier, a priority, a runtime stack, thread local storage, an instruction pointer, other registers needed by the underlying operating system and hardware to execute the computations in the thread. So that's what it's classically had. Java 19, and conceivably henceforth, refers to these types of classic Java threads as so-called platform threads. So a platform thread is just a traditional Java thread that you know and love for 25, 30 years. Each Java platform thread is associated one-to-one -one with an operating system kernel thread. So every time you allocate a thread object in Java, a kernel thread, a platform thread, a traditional thread, a OS kernel thread was allocated in, in modern versions of Java. And so a platform thread contains all the same unique state as a traditional Java thread. We just talked about a bunch of those things. You can use platform threads for pretty much everything. In fact, you can use it for everything. Any kind of task you want to have that runs streams of instructions to get the job done, a platform thread is suitable for that. However, there are some limitations. In particular, because they're associated one-to-one -one with kernel threads, there's a bunch of state that's maintained in the operating system kernel, like virtual memory, for example. And if you have a lot of kernel threads, a lot of Java threads that are platform threads, and hence kernel threads, it takes up a lot of space. And so you can realistically have you know, probably about 1,000 or so, maybe less, before your program starts to, your, your system starts to slow down. And of course, your, your mileage may vary, and it all depends on how much um, memory you have, how much memory you allocate to the operating system or the virtual machine the processor speed, et cetera, et cetera. But they're, they're a finite resource. In contrast, Java 19 also defines something called a virtual thread, which is a lightweight concurrency object. So we'll talk what it means to be lightweight, but you can think visually of the platform thread as being this big steroid pumped up muscle thing, and the virtual thread is like the scrawny little um, younger kid or whatever. So that's, that's what you should think about, virtual thread versus platform thread. Now, it turns out that being scrawny is, a, is an advantage in this context. So one of the things to note about a, a virtual thread is it's a so-called user thread rather than a kernel thread. So you can have a whole bunch of Java virtual threads which run at user level instead of kernel space level. Moreover, it's scheduled by the Java execution environment rather than the underlying operating system, whereas the kernel threads and the platform threads that use kernel threads are scheduled by the operating system. The Java virtual machine or the Java execution environment does the scheduling for virtual threads. As a consequence, you can have a very, very large number of virtual threads. Anybody who knows the Austin Powers movies understands why the one billion virtual threads would be somewhat amusing. You probably haven't seen the Austin Powers movies, but they're funny. Um, and so the main point, the main benefit is you can have gobs and gobs and gobs of virtual threads, e easily hundreds of thousands of them without breaking a sweat, perhaps more if you have enough memory. Virtual threads under the hood are multiplexed atop a pool of carrier threads. Carrier threads are actual Java threads, platform threads. They, they call them carrier threads for various reasons. But they're, they are associated with actual kernel threads that actually take up space and are going to be mapped to the underlying multi-core processor cores. Um, but the virtual threads are multiplexed on top of them. So each carrier thread has a bunch of virtual threads that can be running 
At any given time, one of them will be running and others could be waiting or blocked or whatever, or waiting to run. And the nice thing about virtual threads, which makes them so powerful and so efficient and scalable, is that any blocking operations that are called in the context of a virtual thread don't actually block the underlying carrier thread. They just kind of park themselves off to the side. And then when whatever they're waiting on, like an I.O. event or a lock of some kind or some kind of synchronizer, et cetera, when they're ready to run, then they become runnable, and then they can start to run when it's their turn to run on top of the carrier thread. So we're basically multiplexing virtual threads atop a smaller number of carrier threads. So therefore, you can have a very large number of virtual threads doing requests and processing and whatever run in the context of a smaller pool, a very small pool of carrier threads. They're typically about as many carrier threads as there would be cores, plus or minus some uh, number, depending on what you're doing. Right now, the Java fork join framework is used to implement the uh, carrier threads and the virtual threads that run on top of them. So you can read more about that as this link. We won't talk a lot about the Java fork join framework. In this class, I have another class that goes into that in great, great detail. And you can look at some videos on my website if you want to learn more about the fork join framework. So that's an overview of Java platform threads versus virtual threads. We are going to get some great chance to play around with these concepts in this course because we're going to combine them with the features we have with the Spring WebMVC stuff so that the actual processing that takes place in our applications runs in virtual threads. And we're going to do that most notably in the context of another newfangled cool thing that was added to Java recently called structured concurrency. However, that will have to wait till next class because we've run out of time.